Hey guys. All right, I'm the Executive Associate Athletic Director here at Georgia with the clients. Um, you've heard us, seen us talk to you at the beginning of the year about uh, sports wagering and lots of other compliance issues. We've got a great speaker tonight. Um, you heard us talk at the beginning of the year. You can't bet on NCAA sponsored sports. You can't furnish any information to people who are betting on NCAA sponsored sports. It goes for things like uh, DraftKings and fantasy sports. Anytime you're putting any money down on uh, any money into a pot related to sports that the NCAA sponsors, and you can win something on the other end, you got an NCAA problem. So we're going to talk about it a little bit tonight. We've got a great speaker, uh, Michael Franzis. You're going to see a video here in just a minute, give you a little background to show that there are other real life consequences to sports wagering and, and those types of things. So. Uh, pay close attention to him. We appreciate everybody being here. And if you ever have any questions, feel free to come see me. Thanks. Good 
be honest, is this how you like to spend your Sunday nights? Not really, right? You'd rather be at the movies doing something else? Okay, well you got me for about an hour. And I'm going to speak to you for about a half an hour, maybe 35 minutes, then I'm going to open it up for questions and come on. How often in your life have you ever had the opportunity to ask a formal mob guy, real mob guy, any kind of question that you want? You can ask me anything you want. I promise you won't offend me. If I don't want to answer, I won't. I know how to take the fifth. I've done that many times in my life. So you can ask me anything you want, I promise. Okay, no problem there. But you know, you must be saying to yourself, what the heck's going on with my school here? Are they run out of speakers? Is something going wrong? A former mop guy? What is this guy doing here? What, you know, what could he possibly have to say that can benefit me in any way? Well, let me just put your mind at ease. First of all, I have seven children. I have five daughters, two sons. Five of them went through college, all the girls. Okay, unfortunately, my two boys didn't get there, but they're doing okay, thank God for that. So I know a little bit about kids, because I got a bunch of my own. Okay, secondly, I'm gonna tell you why I'm here, how I got here, and you know, whenever anybody comes up to you to speak to you about anything, you know, an adult that's been through some stuff in their life, you should listen. It's only an hour, you may get one or two little things that can really be helpful to you in your life. Your guy here told you about gambling. Let me tell you this, people, I'm an expert on gambling. You know why? Because back in the day, I had several bookmakers that were working for me. Bookmakers, for those of you that don't know that, are people that take uh, bets illegally. And normally, oh, they, they're associated with organized crime. I had 13 of them that reported to me at one point in time. We had a lot of athletes gambling with us, and I'm going to be real honest, you're not going to like me for this, but I'm telling you straight. Many times we put athletes in compromising positions where they did compromise the outcome of the game. It happens. And I was responsible for that at one point in time. And that's one of the reasons I'm here, for you, here with you tonight. The other thing is relationships. Okay, I came out of a bad life, spent 20 some odd years on the street, okay, from about the time I was your age here. And as a result, I suffered a lot of consequences over it, and I'll tell you this right now, and you can take this to the bank. I'm probably the most fortunate, most blessed person that's ever going to walk up on this stage and talk to you about anything. And the reason I say that is because had I been left up to my own to do what I wanted to do and follow the path that I was on, I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. And quite honestly, that's what I deserve. That's what I earned for myself. I had spent over 20 years on the street, every day in violation of both God's laws and the laws of man. And it was only by the grace of God that I'm up here today. And we're not going to get into all of that, but I'll tell you that. You'll hear about it in a little bit, part of my story. But let me tell you how this all started, how I got to be speaking. Because if you would have said to me 25 years ago, 30 years ago, that I'd be up here addressing athletes or any of the thousands of people that I speak to on a monthly basis all over the world, I would have said they're out of your mind. But it just goes to show you in life, you can start off one way, end up 180 degrees to the other side. Sometimes good, other times bad. In my case, I happen to be very fortunate that I'm here tonight. So here's the deal. It was back in uh, 1994. I was finishing up a 10-year prison sentence in Lompoc Federal Prison. I had been indicted and took a plea for racketeering. For those of you that know that, that's a big tool that the government uses against organized crime. Racketeering Influence Corrupt Organization Act. I had two racketeering indictments, actually. One that I beat, I was acquitted in court, and this one here, I took a plea. I was finishing up a 10-year prison sentence. The last three years, they had me in a hole. I was in solitary confinement. 24 hours a day, six by eight cell, that was it, me and God. And I was in there actually for 29 months and seven days. And every day while I was in there, okay, I would write the warden, because the reason they had me in there is allegedly for my own protection. I had walked away from that life, you're not allowed to do that, there was a contract on my life, people were trying to hurt me, and so while I was in prison, they didn't want to put me out on the yard, figuring I would get hurt, it was all nonsense, I would have been okay out on the yard, I was in Lompoc, California, but they were really trying to give me the business because they wanted me to cooperate, testify against my former associates. I refused to do that, and as a result, they gave me a very tough time in prison. So I'm in the hole 29 months and seven days. Every single day, I wrote the warden. I had a yellow pad and paper. That's all they gave us down there, and a pencil, rather. I would write the warden. Warden, let me out of here. There's no mob guys out on this yard. I can make it out here. I'm not afraid. Okay, let me out. It took him 29 months and seven days to be exact. He sends a uh, correctional officer down to my cell. Francis, the warden wants to see you. I said, great. I didn't know what it was about, but let's go. I need to get, get out of here. We get up to the warden's office, and as I approach him, I'll never forget. The door is open. 
He looks at me, I've never seen him before, and he walks over to his file cabinet, opens the drawer, and in there are all my letters. They're required to keep them. And he looks at me, he says, Francis, you're wearing me out with these letters. Every day I get another one. I said, hey, Warden, I got a lot of time on my hands. I figure I'll write you. What else am I going to do, right? So he looks at me and he says, you know, just for your persistence alone, I'm going to let you out of here. He said, if you thought you were going to get hurt and killed, you wouldn't ask to go out. I don't think you're stupid. He said, you're not going to escape. you only got six months left to go. I'm going to let you out on the yard. But here's the deal. You're going to have to sign a waiver. If anything does happen to you out on the yard, if you should get hurt, somebody kills you, whatever, you're not going to hold the Bureau of Prisons responsible. I said, hey, I'll sign anything that you want. Give it to me. So I signed it. Okay, I had lost 20 pounds. I still had a young, pretty wife at home. I wanted to get myself back in shape. I figured I'd start walking in the yard, get to the weight room, get myself back in condition. I had a Sony Walkman. Anything you know what that is? Okay, that was the, those old antique things, you know, that we used to all play music on, all that kind of stuff. You don't know, that was 20 years ago. Anyway, I had a Sony Walkman. I put it on, I start walking the track, and I felt like I was free. Beautiful day out in sunny California. I'm walking the track, I get about halfway around. And I hear over the loudspeaker, Francis, report back to the warden's office. Now, I knew that wasn't good news. I was what you call a central monitoring inmate, meaning any movement on my behalf had to be approved by Washington, D.C. So I figured they got a call the warden did from Washington. They said, lock me up again. And I was preparing my whole speech to get there and try to keep myself out. When I get to the office, it gets worse. I see two guys in suits. I don't need to see the badge. I see the suit and the shoes. I knew who they were. They were FBI agents. I figured, hey, they're going to put pressure on me again. They want me to testify another case. So when I see them, I turn around. I start walking away. I said, guys, leave me alone. I said, you know, I'm not cooperating. Put me back in the hall. I'll finish up my time. That's it. Francis, we need to talk to you. It's important. I said, guys, leave me alone. They said, get back here. It's important. Now, I thought maybe something happened with my family. They came to deliver a message. I didn't know what the deal was. So I go back in, and we go and sit in the office. I said, guys, you know I'm not cooperating. That deal is gone. They said, no. They said, we need a favor from you. I said, no favors. Every time you guys ask for something, there's strings attached. I'm not doing any favors. They said, just listen up. They said, Major League Baseball, the NBA, the NFL, and the NHL are getting together to do an anti-gambling video. You claim you turned your life around. We're going to give you an opportunity to prove it. We want you to come and participate in this video. I said, guys, for the last 10 years, you're telling me I'm going to get killed. Now you want me to participate in the video? I said, this has got to be a setup. I said, I want nothing to do with this. They said, no, listen up. It's legit. You guys, you know, you had a bunch of bookmakers on the street. We know you were involved in athletes. We really want you to do this. I said, guys, I'm not interested. They said, okay, listen up. If you agree to do this, we're going to sweeten the pot. They said, how long have you been down? I said, I've been down eight years. You guys know that. You put me here. They said, well, if you agree to do this, we're going to take you out of here for three days. This is going to be filmed in Chicago. we got a hotel room. we actually got a suite for you. king size bed, real pillows, blankets. You haven't had that in a while. They said, you can go down, take a dip in a pool, order room service, pasta, macaroni, whatever you Italians eat, order what you want. They said, have a blast. Who's better than you for three days? Cooperate in this video. So I thought about it a minute. I said, guys, I'll tell you what. I've been down eight years. You get my wife in that hotel room with me, I'll make a video on anything that you want. <laughs> Trust me, I meant it that long time, but it's okay. We will marry. It's all right, right? They said, hey, we'll try. As it turns out, the day they were supposed to take me out was a Monday. I'll never forget, we had an earthquake that day in uh, Southern California. All movement stopped. They couldn't take me out. But since I had agreed to do it, NBA Productions that filmed it, they came into the uh, prison, and they filmed my portion of the video inside the prison. And I told them straight out, you know, how I managed the bookmakers, how we put athletes in trouble, you know, and I told them the whole deal. And it was, they spent about a quarter of a million bucks on it, I think, and they had it all about Pete Rose and Art Schleister and Greg Gumbel was the, uh, the MC. And I did my part. So now I get out six months later, and Major League Baseball and the NBA, they pro approached me directly. I didn't realize they featured me prominently throughout the whole video. And they said, Mike, this video is having a real impact on our players. You know better than most the kind of problems we have with gambling in pro sports. We need you to come and speak to our players. It's an important service you can do for the leagues. And I told the head of security for Major League Baseball, I said, hey, guys, I don't speak to players. I don't do things like that. And I'll never forget, he was a big uh, Irish guy. He was a former homicide detective in New York. And he looked at me and he said, oh, big tough mob guy. You can't speak to a few ball players? I said, all right, set it up. I'm going, right? So that was in 1996. 
1996, I spoke to every Major League Baseball player in spring training. I've been doing that ever since. I visit the teams, I visit the players. We've had a great run with that. NBA started around the same time. NFL started around the same time. I've been doing that, guys and ladies, for about 23 years. In 1998, the NCAA jumped on board. They said, Mike, you need to take this, please, to our universities and our athletes throughout the country. And since that time, I've spoken at over 300 and some odd universities, both Division I and Division II. And I think we've had a, a pretty good run and hopefully been able to impart some valuable information because gambling is an issue. Now, I don't know any of you here. I'm not so much with, the, with the, uh, the ladies, but the guys, I guarantee you, if there's 200 of you in here, okay, 100 of you are gambling on something. There's no doubt about it. You know, and I get it. I understand. You guys are competitive. You know, it's kind of your competitive nature. There's more fun watching a game when you got something right on it, right on it. So I get it. I understand. Okay, and most of you are never going to have a problem. But some of you will, and some of you will have a serious problem. And I'm telling you this, I can spend the rest of the evening here telling you about athletes your age that have destroyed themselves over gambling issues. It's what I've seen in 23 years since I've started doing this, and it's obviously what I saw before, because in some cases I've caused that to happen. And that's not something I'm proud of, people. I'm really not. Okay, but it's a reality. And that's why I'm here. So, you know, I'm going to take a little time. I'll tell you a little bit about my life. We'll talk a little bit about the gambling issue, a little bit about relationships, and then we open it up for questions. Some of you might be curious. Okay, I was born, I was born in uh, Brooklyn. And, and in New York, there are five mafia families, organized crime. In this country, it's called La Cosa Nostra. It's not mafia, but it's pretty well the same thing, similar organizations. My dad, Sonny Francis, was the underboss of the Colombo family, one of the five mafia families, uh, back in the 60s. And that's a very powerful position. And uh, in that life, you have a boss, an underboss, a cop regime, a captain, and a soldier. Some of you have seen The Godfather. There is a position called consigliere. Robert De Paul played that role brilliantly. But in The Godfather, it was fictional, because in, in order to be a sworn, made member of that life and take the oath, and you do take an oath, your father must be Italian. Mom could be of another descent, but your dad must be Italian. My dad was extremely high profile. He was kind of like the John Gotti of his day. I, know, I don't know if any of you have heard of John, but he was probably the most prominent figure uh, to come out of that life in the last 20 years. Very, very high profile, always under investigation. And I grew up a lot differently, I'm sure, than everybody in this room. I grew up hating the police. I hated the government, I hated law enforcement. Not because my dad taught me that way, he was smart, he taught me to respect the law, but it's really because of what I witnessed as a kid growing up. Law enforcement tactics, techniques against organized crime, very different back then than they are today. Today everything is very covert, a lot of undercover informants, high-tech surveillance equipment. Today you can be under investigation, not really know about it until it's too late. Back in my day when my dad was under investigation, they wanted him to know about it for a period of about 10 years. When I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn, later on Long Island, Dad was under investigation from seven or eight different law enforcement agencies. FBI, IRS, Brooklyn DA, Queens Detective, you name it, they were on him. And they all had cars parked around my house 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I was one of seven kids also. Whenever we as a family would leave to go anywhere, we had a parade of law enforcement vehicles following us. Everybody knew we were coming into town. And I witnessed a lot of things that were unpleasant. You know, that was a rough detail. Every once in a while, the agents got a lot uh, out of hand. They did some things that weren't very nice. You know, I was one day, I was playing ball in the street. I was 10 years old, and uh, we lived on kind of an incline. Kid throws a ball, it goes over my head, it rolls down to where two detectives are sitting in the car. As the ball approaches, the guy on the driver's side, he gets out. He was a big, burly guy, and uh, he stops the ball with his foot. And I walk up to him and I said, sir, can I have my ball back, please? And he looks at me, pulls his jacket aside, he's got a gun in there, and he says, this is for your old man one day. Pretty scary stuff when you're 10 years old. I had a lot of skirmishes with them growing up because people, I'll be honest with you, I love my dad. He was my hero in life. He was a great father, very supportive of me. He originally didn't want this life for me. Uh, I was an athlete in school. He wanted me to continue there. He wanted me to go to school and be a doctor. That was his dream for me. And uh, so I loved him a lot, and I always saw law enforcement as the enemy, you know, trying to hurt my dad, trying to disrupt my family. Now, I want to make this very clear right now. I do not feel that way anymore. I finally realized in my life that they were the good guys, we were the bad guys, at least most of the time. Look, any walk of life, anybody can get out of hand. But I'll tell you, people, you cannot, cannot go against law enforcement today in this country. You just can't do it. They got too many weapons, okay? You go that route, you're going down. 
I spent almost 10 years in prison with a lot of young kids coming into the system. 21, 22, 23 years old. Mandatory minimum drug sentences, 15 and 20 years. In the federal system, there's no more parole. You get 20, you're doing 18, you're doing 17 and a half, you're doing 85%. Very, very hard for a young person your age to do that kind of time in prison and come out and be a productive member of society. Almost impossible. And I used to minister, counsel to a lot of them uh, because I had a heart for them. And they all have the same story. Came from a broken home, no father figure in the house, mom trying to do her best, maybe not trying to do her best. He gravitates to the local drug dealer, local gangbanger. Before you know it, he's doing his bidding, ends up in prison, or God forbid, someplace worse. And I know a lot of people have lost their lives in that situation. And I told them straight out, you don't get away with criminal conduct in America anymore. Forget about it. Like I said, they're too sophisticated, too many weapons, too many informants on the street. Your best friend, okay, you guys that play sports, your best friend on the, on the field, on the court, whatever, who has your back because you're trying to win a game, get in trouble with him. And then pray that he doesn't put you in trouble or, or, or cooperate with the government because that's what happens 95% of the time. It's a whole different ballgame out there. And I want to tell you something. This is a lesson for everybody. It doesn't matter how, what age you are, okay? But especially for young people today, remember this. If you, remember, if you forget everything tonight, remember this. In this life, in this world, we are who we hang out with. We are who we associate with. And they will influence you. You know, you must surround yourself with the right people. People are leading you in the wrong direction. You gotta be strong enough to say no, cut the tie, move on. When I was in prison, so many guys that grew up on the street, you know, a lot of them out of the hood. We'd be watching television together. They see a guy out there that they knew from the hood that's now playing ball, whether it be in college or professional sports. And they used to say to me straight out, that homie owes me. When I get out, he owes me. And I said, hold a second, is that your friend? Yeah. Dear friend? Yeah. Then what the heck does he owe you? If he's doing something with his life that's productive and you're sitting in here because you screwed up, why do you want to mess up his life? Let him get through what he's doing. Let him have a career. And then afterwards, if you want to get with him and sit down with him, that's one thing. But let him get through his career. You don't owe anybody anything. Remember that. You do your thing. You do it right. You don't hurt people. But you do what you need to do to progress yourself. Take care of your life. Take care of your family. That's what this is all about. Do the right thing. Okay? Be strong enough to resist anybody, whether it be your best friend or not. Okay? Who's trying to lead you the wrong way. Because people, let me tell you something. Life is tough enough. When everything is good, you don't know what happens sometimes. God forbid there's a sickness, something happens in the family, you're going to find out in business. I got a friend of mine now working with a company for 18 years at a high level. All of a sudden, he gets his pink slip, job over. You never know what happens in this life. It's tough enough when everything is good and you're doing the right thing. You start doing the wrong thing and you start putting more baggage on your shoulders that you got to carry around because you screw up. Before you know it, you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, you say, hey, what the heck did I do? Life starts to move pretty quick when you're in trouble and you do the wrong thing. And it's kind of hard sometimes to correct those things later on in life. Start out right, you got a great opportunity here. You're in school, you're playing sports. When you get out of here, hopefully you're going to have an education, a career, and you're going to move on with your life the right way. Take it from me. Okay? Because I made a lot of mistakes, and I can say only by the grace of God am I here today. And I mean that. And that's why I impart some of this knowledge with, for you. So my dad got in trouble back then. He was indicted several times, went to trial for some very serious crimes in New York, ended up beating three cases, twice for grand larceny, once for murder. Went to trial, he was acquitted. 1966, my dad was indicted in federal court for masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies. He was convicted and in 67 sentenced to 50, five old, uh, five old years in prison. It was the longest sentence for a bank robbery conspiracy case ever given up to that point. 1970, my dad lost all his appeals. They shipped him off to Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas to do his time. I was a pre-med student at Hofstra University. I was playing football. I was devastated when my dad went in. He was 50 when he went in. Figured he had 50 on top of that. My dad would never come out of prison alive. Just as an aside, today, my dad's 102 years old. He just celebrated his birthday, February 6th, 102. He did 38 years in prison on that 50. He was in and out five times, each time on a parole violation, and each time for associating with another fellow, somebody alleged to be an organized crime. You can't do that when you're on federal parole. He did 38 years, and I want to tell you something, people. My dad did a lot of bad things in his life, obviously. So did I. 
I went to jail for a crime that I was guilty of. I pled guilty. I did my time. But that particular crime that my dad did all this time for, he was innocent of. My dad was no bank robber. I'll take that to my grave. Okay, I investigated that case thoroughly for years. We spoke to every witness that testified against him. They all recanted their testimony, said they lied at the trial. We gave them lie detector tests, proved that they lied at the trial. We can never get the conviction overturned. And you know what that shows you? It's what I tell all the young people. Because I work with a lot of gangbangers. I go into prisons, juvenile halls. You know what it tells you? The system is not always fair. You put that bullseye on your back, okay, you get a, a reputation for being a bad person, eventually they're going to catch up with you. And it might be for something you didn't do. The best way to stay away from that, stay away from it. Just avoid it. Don't put yourself in a position where you can get yourself in trouble. Okay, just stay away from it. So when dad goes to jail, I lose interest in school. Joe Colombo was the boss of my family. We were very close. He kind of took me under his wing, stopped meeting a lot of my dad's friends. They were saying, Mike, what are you doing going to school? If you don't help your father out, he's going to die in prison. Very affected by that. Go see dad in Leavenworth or in the visiting room. Dad, I'm not going to school anymore. If I don't help you out, you're going to die in here. He was upset. Didn't want it for me. We argued a little bit. I was a headstrong kid. He knew my mind was made up. Son, if you're going to be on the street, I need you on the street the right way in his mind. The right way was to become a member of his life. He said, go home, somebody will be in touch with you, do whatever you're told. And my dad at that point in time proposed me for membership in that life. You know, to become a member of that life, you can't just go up to somebody and say, hey, I'd like to join, what do I have to do? Somebody has to propose you, vouch for you, say you have what it takes. I was 22 years old, I was in kind of like a pledge period, I met with the boss, he ran it down to me. He said, I heard you want to become a member of this life, your father sent the message. I said, that's true. He said, here's the deal. From now on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're on call to serve this family, the Colombo family. That means if your mother is sick and she's dying, and you're at her bedside, and we call you to serve as you leave your mother, you come and serve us. From now on, we're number one in your life before anything and everything. When and if we feel you deserve this privilege, this honor to become a member, we'll let you know. 22 years old, for the next year and a half, I was in like a pledge period, I had to do anything and everything I was told to do to prove myself worthy. Could have been something very menial, a lot of discipline in that life, a lot of authority, a lot of alleged respect. You had a meeting at 8 o'clock, you weren't there at 7.30, you were late. You can never be late in that life. Drive the boss to a meeting, sit in the car for four or five hours. God forbid you leave before he comes out. You go to the restroom, get a newspaper. He comes out, you're not in the car, you're in trouble. I know I did that once and I paid the price. A lot of stuff like that. I want to be really honest with all of you tonight because you need to understand, again, how fortunate I am here to be here and, and, and really enjoying a session with you. Hopefully I give you some good information. That life at times, people, is very violent. And if you're part of the life, you're part of the violence, and there's no escape. If anybody tells you differently, they're either not being honest with you or they weren't a made member of that life. And that's the expression that's used when you take the oath and become officially a member of that life. Halloween night, 1975, I proved myself worthy in their eyes. I walked into a room, I did with five other gentlemen. That night we all took an oath and became sworn, made members of the Colombo family. An oath I took very seriously back then. I take it very seriously tonight, even though I don't consider myself a member of the life anymore. You come into the life, you don't sign a contract, there's no retirement age. You probably heard this, they say when you leave that life, you either leave in a coffin, or you join the government and enter a witness protection program. Obviously I've done neither. We walked into a room individually, very solemn ceremony, dimly lit room late at night. Wanted you to know the seriousness of what you were getting involved in. I walked down the aisle, the boss was seated at the uh, head of like a horseshoe configuration. Underboss, consigliere to his left and right, all the captains were alongside of them. Walked down the aisle, stood in front of the boss, held out my hand, took my, the knife right here, cut my finger, some blood dropped on the floor. This is a blood oath. I cupped my hands, he took a picture of a saint, Catherine Baltacar, put it in my hands and lit it a flame. Didn't hurt, it burned quickly, it was merely symbolic. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are born again into a new life, into La Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours. Violate what you know about this life, betray your brothers, and you will die and burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. Do you accept? I said, yes, I do. The other five guys went in, they all took the oath. You come into the life, you come in as a soldier. I was motivated to do two things. One, get my dad out of prison. I did get him out after 10 years. Told you what happened, he violated several times, kept going back. Secondly, I wanted to make money. My dad said in this life, you make money, it translates to power, not unlike the real world. 
You saw the DVD, no need to really go into that right now. Uh, I was fortunate, I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business. I was very aggressive on the street, went on to bring some different things into the family that hadn't been done before, went on to make a very significant amount of money. In 1980, the boss of my family was now doing life in 